Thank you very much, Adam. Um, well, chairing a meeting of this kind, I feel rather like Melvin Bragg chairing an episode of In Our Time, if any of you have ever listened to those. And I've certainly got specialists with me, uh, even more impressive specialists than Melvin normally has. Uh, let me introduce my colleagues. Um, first of all, Sir Stephen O'Brien, um, a former member of parliament and minister in the coalition government, and also UN, un he was UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. Right Honourable Sir Stephen O'Brien. Um, Stephen, it's very good to uh, have you with us this evening. Thank you, Chris. Delighted. Uh, thank you. And then uh, Hamish uh, de Breton Gordon, the author of the book Chemical Warrior, which is in part, at least, what we're going to be talking about. Uh, uh, you, Hamish, you put your copies of the book so far behind you that it's actually rather difficult to see in the picture. So I thought I'd hold mine up. Um, Hamish has a, a history in the armed forces of being in charge of uh, our approach to dealing with chemical weapons and has as much boots on the ground experience as you could possibly imagine. Um, going back, for example, to 30 years ago today, when uh, you were just finishing the uh, Iraq conflict, were you not, Hamish? Um, Absolutely. And I'm also delighted that Hamish is, uh, has been elected as a visiting fellow of Magdalen College, and I've been hoping to welcome him there uh, when I took over as master in October. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic has put a stop to our visiting fellows programme for the time being. But Hamish, we're still very much looking forward to seeing you uh, when some sort of normal contact can be resumed. Um, now, the, the form is, as Adam has just explained, that uh, we're going to have a discussion among the three of us, uh, which I shall chair um, in a fairly loose fashion and then throw the floor open to questions. But please feel free to add questions as the conversation goes along. You can do that by using the Q&A facility, which I, if I've mastered the technology, uh, is the uh, rightmost of the bottom icons at the bottom of the uh, web screen. So please feel free to put in whatever questions you would like, and uh, then we'll come to those and work our way through them. So Hamish, can I begin with you? Could you tell us what it was that uh, inspired you to write this book and how your experience led to the writing of it? Well, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Christopher. And I'm, I feel yeah, honored or almost as a sort of a imposter syndrome being part of the great Magdalen College, uh, but not being there. And I hope that uh, certainly next term that might well be possible. Um, the book itself, there were three reasons that, that I wrote it. Uh, very apposite, the first two, to what we're going to discuss today. Um, I feel a heartfelt issue that the Syrian people have been terribly let down by the international community, in, including our own country. I've been in and out of Syria since the beginning of the war, ostensibly collecting evidence and working with NGOs. Um, and as you say, 30 years ago today, I was a young officer fighting in the first Gulf War, um, which I think really honed my thinking you know, to one of our more successful uh, interventions. Allied to that, um, I've worked very closely with the Iraqi Kurds, and I think we owe them a, a huge debt of gratitude. I was their chemical weapons advisor in the fight with Islamic States in 2015 to 2017. And, um, I think you know, it was them who predominantly led the fight against ISIS. Their boots on the ground meant that we, the Brits, did not have to put boots on the ground. And um, I really think the debt of gratitude to them is huge. The second reason, as you said, I, I've spent most of my life in, in the chemical and biological counter-terrorism world. And actually with the Peshmerga, we were we were gassed by Islamic State near Mosul in 2016. So I have very personal experience of what it's like to be for these weapons to be used on them. And I've seen them used in Syria and, and they're absolutely abhorrent, they're indiscriminate, they mainly affect those who can't protect themselves, civilians, women and children. And the fact that they've been used in a widespread way by the Syrians and recently by the Russians, I'm talking to you from Salisbury, where we had the Salisbury nerve agent attack two years ago. Um, so I really wanted to get the debate going on that and allied to that biological weapons. 
uh, which I think you know, we should talk about COVID because I'm not suggesting in any way it's a biological weapon, but it could be. And um, there is too much biological engineering going on in various laboratories around the world where accidents or thefts could happen. And the legal framework dealing with biological and toxic weapons is very thin. And the third reason, uh, very selfish, um, I, I have two medical conditions, cardiac sudden death syndrome, which sounds very dramatic. It is if you don't know you've got it. Um, and I, 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 I really shout for them. Whenever you hear of young boys and girls dying on sports pitches, most of the time it's sudden cardiac death syndrome. Uh, so I'm trying to get more publicity for that to get people tested. And like many people of my age, um, I also have prostate cancer, luckily the, the not so bad bit, uh, and trying to push people to make sure they get tested so, so we can get rid of this dreadful disease. But in a round, that, that's, that's where the book came from. And, um, and hopefully, you know, my turning from a soldier to a humanitarian has been a challenging thing. But I, I like to think that I've got a, a few things, a bit of advice or, or, or a voice to speak about these particular areas. Hamish, thank you very much. That, that's extremely helpful and, and very moving. Um, Stephen, you, you've had experience both in politics, but also in humanitarian diplomacy at a very high level. Uh, what would you add to that? Well, I will certainly be very interested to hear from Hamish how he has found his uh, makeup and experience um, of unquestionably when you read the book, which is a really good read, I do recommend everybody to, to get hold of a copy, um, of, of innate courage, but at the same time, compassion. And it applies both to the military experience and to the humanitarian experience, particularly when you read about the uh, determination to get into Syria to, to get the samples. Mm. And so um, I, I, I'm very interested, um, Hamish, to understand how, um, and you're very open and honest about this, how the, the sort of mental makeup and the motivations have driven you to, to feel this real determination to, to sort of deliver a form of justice, which is about, um, uh, particularly for innocent people caught up in conflict. And, and the background to my question, as, as Sir Christopher has just indicated, is you know, having been on the political side where you know, one has to make choices about what one does, when you find yourself uh, coordinating this world response to humanitarian emergency and people in need, of course, you've only got a few levers to pull. And um, one of the things that's really striking is that um, you mentioned that this is the anniversary, 30th anniversary of the end of the Gulf War One, arguably a good military intervention, just a rather failed post-military intervention. Uh, but this is also the anniversary of the time when the office at the UN that I was responsible for was set up, the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, which was set up to respond to people in need from natural emergencies. But the people in need around the world for those last 30 years have been 90% caused by conflicts. And so this interplay between conflict and need and the, and the sort of makeup of people we need to go in there and to, to support uh, how, uh, how very important it is to recognise that um, uh, the motivation to be humanitarian comes from a place not of simply compassion, but also practical and expertise. Hamish. Okay. Hey, Hamish, t t tell us about that, please, and, and also in particular about the whole idea of gathering the evidence of what has yeah. happened, because, you know, as a former judge, that's one of the things that always struck me, that there are any number of allegations and news stories, particularly about the use of chemical weapons, but actual hard evidence which a court can use is usually a very different matter. Absolutely, and I think that that is the nub of the, the issue with chemical and biological weapons. And I think I've, had, having spent 23 years as a soldier in, in Iraq, a number, number of times, Afghanistan, it was very salutary to go into Syria as a civilian and, and then work with the Peshmerga in Iraq in conflict. Um, and what drove me, I think, was frustration. Uh, particularly with Syria. Um, you know, I, I think I was with Stephen in the House of Parliament in September 2013 when the debate was 
taking place on whether we should uh, attack uh, Assad for using chemical weapons on, on his own people. 1,500 people died on the 23rd, 21st of August 2013 when Assad's forces dropped sarin on, on Ghouta suburb. And most of those who were killed were women and children. Now, I'd been in Syria before then because there'd been smaller attacks. And when I came back to London to brief people in Whitehall and Westminster, uh, the, the sort of stock line I got was, it's all very good, Hamish, but we can't do anything without evidence. And, and that really sort of drove me. And I, I got incredibly frustrated. In fact, I was arrested at Heathrow on my way back in July 2013 from Syria for allegedly bringing evidence back into the country, which you know, I, I, I wasn't doing. But that, that sort of drove me on. In my, in my life in the British military, one of the things that we did, or we were always doing when chemical or biological weapons were involved, was, was collecting evidence. That chain of evidence is, is so important that you, you guys will understand far better than I, but it was driven into me. So then when we had the Guta event and parliament voted not to strike Assad, which eight, eight years later, you know, I think is still a desperately poor decision. You know, had we given him, had we taken out his chemical arsenal then, um, I don't think we would be in the position now. Over 5 million civilian, uh, over 500,000 civilians uh, have been killed and 11 million displaced within Syria. And we know the 5 million refugees. So after that, it was then, it was then really driven home to me. We must get evidence. And uh, with a very brave Syrian called Hussein, who was a doctor, he, he was always known as Hazim the Ken. He got in touch with me through Skype actually to say, you know, how can you help uh, and, and set up something called a, uh, the CBRN task force. And the idea behind that was to set up the hospitals to treat casualties because um, one of the hospitals that dealt with most of the casualties in August, 2013, uh, run by OSAM, a charity that I support and help, nine, seven of the nine doctors treating that morning died from secondary contamination. So the first thing was to, to educate the Syrians how to deal with these attacks. The second thing was to collect evidence. It was quite clear that the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which is the UN's policeman, the Chemical Weapons Convention, couldn't get into Syria, number one, because the Syrians aren't signatories to the convention, and number two, it was too dangerous. So the evidence, so it was clear to me, the only way that we were going to get evidence out was to organize it and collect it ourselves. And on the on April 2014, I got a call from Hussein saying there's been a chemical attack in Talamanis and Cafazita. We're there, we've got the evidence, come and analyze it. Um, and I managed, I broke off from a skiing holiday, managed to get to the Syrian border pretty quickly, analyzed the samples, which proved that chlorine had been used. Uh, and we had, we had two samples uh, and the other samples went to the OPCW, which nine months later, they agreed with our findings. To me, that was, that was really salutary. Uh, and I could go back to parliament and say, look, this, this is the hard evidence. But it was, you know, the, the inflexibility, I think, of the OPCW and the UN. And as, as you will understand far better than I, um, actually, because the UN security, the permanent members of the UN Security Council have a veto, any, any hard evidence we were getting out of Syria invariably was vetoed by the Russians and therefore creating the inertia and therefore uh, not a lot happening. So it was actually seeing it and, and hearing of um, so many children and it's the children who, who, who really get you. And having children myself, I describe in the book uh, of being in a hospital where um, 27 children arrived from a bar bomb attack and 26 of them died. And the one girl who survived, I escorted her to the border. And because she didn't have the paperwork, she died there at the border. And it was, you know, the, the two things that, that I see when I wake up at night occasionally are, are her eyes and a little boy who I met in Syria in 2019, who lost both legs and an arm. And, and they, they, you know, that, that injustice 
is something that, that sort of really keeps me driving on, which is why I'm delighted to have the opportunity at a webinar like this to bring these up. So very long answer to your question. It was frustration and the fact that, you know, some of our pro processes in the UN for collecting this evidence, for a lot of reasons that, that I'm sure you will be able to explain far better than I can, just are not as effective as they should be. Um, and that's why people like myself, and I'm, I'm not, you know, there, there are other people doing this and doing, you know, much more extreme things. But the whole thing about my humanitarian life is, is having seen it on both sides, you know, if one can just push the dial a tiny bit and make a tiny bit of difference, and if there are enough of us doing it, one hopefully can achieve things that perhaps you know, some other governments and, and huge institutions can't. I sort of almost feel, Christopher, if I may, I need to turn the question back on you, which is not quite what this webinar is meant to be about, <laughs> but um, because I certainly suffered exactly the same in 2016 when the convoy that I had arranged uh, got completely obliterated um, just outside Aleppo. You, uh, in fact, you do refer to this in your book. Uh, and, you know, we tried so hard, very quickly, to get people into the site, to seal the site, to preserve the evidence, to then get, gather the evidence. And the whole time we were simply frustrated as the UN officially and, you know, me making speeches in a very public way. Um, but it didn't cut any ice with those who simply wished to block us, which in that case were, were the Russians, of course, in support of their uh, proxy, the Syrians. So it, it turns the question, which is the same as you've just asked, uh, Hamish, back on to Christopher a bit, is to if IHL and the whole process, in international humanitarian law and all the processes that we we talk about as being our sort of benchmark of where we can move towards some form of accountability for actions across borders, across the world. And, you know, it does feel, particularly for those of us who've been, as it were, engaged on the ground in whichever way, that um, it, it doesn't have teeth and we're not sure where the teeth may come from. I mean, it, it, does that sum up your uh, worry as well, Hamish? And we might put the pressure back on Christopher. <laughs> Entirely. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, no, but you're absolutely right. The, there is a problem generally with international law of uh, teeth. It's not as bad across the board as people imagine it to be. Uh, you know, I was nine years on the International Court of Justice, and one of the extraordinary things about the ICJ is that virtually every judgment it's ever given has been complied with. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's a record that you probably wouldn't find matched, for example, if you went to the family courts in this country and asked, how are you faring with enforcing injunctions that requires one parent to allow the other parent custody to the children after a divorce? And nor would it um, look bad as a, a, by comparison, for example, with enforcing um, consumer judgments against uh, dodgy companies uh, over the sale of anything, secondhand cars, video players, whatever it happens to be. But when you get to humanitarian law, enforcement has always been a particular Achilles heel. And I think that's been recognized going back more than a century. And I think there are three reasons for that. The first is that you're going to the absolute heart of the security issues of a state. And they are not surprisingly very reluctant to open their doors in matters like that, particularly where they know that they or their client state is in the wrong. The second is that it's frankly much more fashionable in the diplomatic world to be able to say, well, look at this new treaty we've just negotiated, um, rather than to say, this isn't a new treaty, it's an old one, but we've actually taken practical steps to implement it. Mm. Uh, and that can be a real, that, that's a real political problem. It, it holds back the idea of enforcement. And the third difficulty is that in recent times, there has at least been one big step forward in enforcement, which is the creation of the International Criminal Court, which isn't just important in itself, it's also led to a tightening up of the law within states, as you can see from this recent conviction in Germany of the um, Syrian uh, officer. But the focus on criminal prosecution after the event is often at the expense of paying attention to other things. Uh, 
humanitarian training, for example, most of the conflicts you've been speaking about are conflicts that have been fought by young, inexperienced, untrained soldiers who were usually terrified. And that's not a group of people who are likely to have given a lot of thought to the Geneva Convention on Prisoners of War or the uh, Treaties on Chemical and Biological Weapons. So I, I think we have to, in, in looking at enforcement, we have to look at getting the evidence, which is really difficult in a great many cases, and particularly with something like chemical weaponry, where if you leave it any length of time, the evidence is gone. Um, you mm -hmm. won't be able to, to acquire it. It's got to be done straight away. And secondly, on training and instilling in uh, the military some kind of what I call a humanitarian reflex. It's a matter of making sure the lawyers don't overcomplicate things as well. Um, I'm afraid my profession is very good at coming up with complicated subtleties. That might be fine when you're arguing a case in the Supreme Court or in the ICJ. It's a very different matter when you're trying to explain a handful of basic rules to a young, newly qualified second lieutenant in an army that perhaps has very little in the way of cohesion. It's a different matter if you're dealing with a very professional force like the British Army, but if you're dealing with some of these that have been put together at the last minute, much harder. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chris. Well, uh, in the light of that, uh, there are a couple of other areas which your book really is quite a good span, uh, Hamish, beyond all this, and um, of course covers uh, your own life, uh, obviously your, your personal health issues. Um, I have to say it's an extremely touching love story with your wife, Julia, which I think all of us uh, enjoy uh, that coming through. Um, but in particular, uh, your experience, where does that leave you post, particularly post Salisbury? And now we've had COVID, where does that leave you with a sense of what lessons do we need to learn and try and put in place to not just better protect ourselves, but to become much more responsible world citizens to uh, enable us to have uh, a better protection for people around the world, uh, whether they're in conflict or not, but just because of the emerging threat of chemical and biological weapons and uh, substances. Well, I, I think that, that is a really interesting perspective. And, and just stepping back a, a second to Sir Christen's point about evidence, you know, one of the huge challenges we had in Syria was um, you know, I, I was there telling people to collect evidence uh, and they were going, you know, what, why bother? Um, Assad and the Russians are bombing us. They're bombing hospitals, you know, which is great. The Geneva Convention and everything else. And, and the frustration I had with the NGOs I was working with is, is when, when, when our hospitals were placed down, as per the UN rules, we were giving the coordinates of those hospitals to the UN, who were then sharing them you know, with the other antagonists. But the Russians and the Syrians were then typing those grid references into their targeting uh, systems and bingo, the next day we, we'd get a, a rocket through these hospitals. So people were, you know, incredibly frustrated. And, and one of the things that, that kept me going and kept them going, I said, look, you know, I, I fought in the Bosnian War 20 years ago uh, and some of those generals and that some of those people who committed atrocities are now either in jail or are being committed at the International Criminal Court. So whatever you think, you collect evidence and at some stage those responsible will pay for it. So that to me, that was very, very compelling indeed. Going on to your point about, you know, the, the biological and chemical weapons, um, I, I think one, one thing I say in the book and, and, and said quite a lot, you know, if, you, if you have no morals or scruples, chemical weapons and biological weapons are brilliant. Um, you get an incredible bang for your buck. If you're a terrorist, they're the ultimate terror weapon. And that is why uh, they would use them. Incidentally, Osama bin Laden for a long time thought that chemical and biological weapons were even beyond his pale. But that's certainly not the view of the jihadists and, uh, and, and ISIS now. And when you look at Salisbury, you know, we, the, I think the Russians, it, we, we could debate for hours on why the Russians committed a chemical attack in Salisbury on British soil.
But I think one of them is they were emboldened. I personally think Assad is still in power because he used chemical weapons. And interestingly enough, only today, one of his bloggers, one of these dreadful people who push out his propaganda and disinformation is saying today on the internet, why on earth did we give up our chemical weapons? Um, because you know the world's let us down. If we still had them, people would, would listen to us, which, which is an absolute shock. But I think the Russians were emboldened and they just didn't think anybody would do anything if they used chemical weapons. I mean, it does seem bizarre that they use you know, Novichok with sort of fourth generation nerve agent, incredibly toxic. It could have killed thousands of people in Salisbury. It was pure luck and the brilliance of the police and the British military and the security services that it didn't. But but they were emboldened. I mean, they didn't think anybody would do anything. And I, you know, I, I think Putin does not really care much for collateral damage anyway. I've, you know, I've been slightly at the buck of his his anger, which has, you know, has caused some nervousness. But I'm 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 pretty clear if I was a Russian. I would probably suffer the same fate as Alexei Navalny or Litvinenko. The fact that I'm not is, is I'm inconsequential to him. But I think that is the fact that he is prepared to use them is, is because he believes that nobody will do anything about it. And that, and that brings out a wider story to the world that you know, unless we really um, tighten up the Chemical Weapons Convention, and, and have a biological weapons convention. I mean, we do have a biological weapons convention. If I, you know, it's funded about $100,000 a year, whereas the uh, chemical weapons convention, I think is funded to about, you know, two or $300 million to do its job. And the reasons for it, the biological lack of funding is, you know, we won't go into it here, but, you know, if we are to police it and make sure that biological weapons do not become an issue, and COVID has, you know, I'm supposed to be you know, a great biological security expert, but COVID completely blindsided me. People like me have been looking at highly toxic pathogens like anthrax. And I describe in the book dealing with a potential Al-Qaeda anthrax attack in Iraq. Um, but having a not very toxic pathogen, but highly transmissible, you know, got us all down. And, and COVID has had such an impact. We cannot leave it like that. We must make things better. Again, a very long sort of answer to your question, um, Stephen. We, we, we're in a different world now than we were back in 30 years ago, the Gulf War. And I hope that the integrated strategic defence review that we're about to hear about in two weeks really does reflect that. But there is a dichotomy, I think, here. They're in a real challenge where, you know, the... the the, the, the environment and threats, cyber, chemical and biological are changing things. Um, and the natural thing to do would be to say, right, well, we don't need all these tanks and aircraft and, and ships and all the rest of it. Uh, we need something else to deal with it. Well, we certainly need the capability to deal with these um, you know, contemporary weapons, as it were. But we also need those people, you know, one of the things that I'm, you know, I'm so hugely proud of the British military is the men and women in it and, and the way that they approach these things. I mean, it, it is a little bit like Tommy this and Tommy that and, and others at times, but, you know, putting young people in war zones for, you know, it, it's hugely challenging. And, and um, I think, you know, we've had a few issues, but I think generally they do a fantastic job. But even in the future, we still need a we, we, we still need an amount of people to be able to achieve an effect. And I just hope that we don't slash our numbers to replace it with technology. For one, you know, the the amount of military personnel involved in COVID delivery, you know, military aid to the civil authorities is huge. You know, if we mm. slash it too much, we're not going to be able to, to do that uh, sort of thing. So a, a, a long answer to, to your question, we're, we're approaching a, a, a new era, I think. We must be ref, reflective for the threats that are out there so that uh, we protect our people. Um, we might need a slightly different military, I expect, but, but we, we still need boots on the ground, if, as it were. You, 
you still need to engage with people on the ground. And, you know, of course, the, the art of war is winning without fighting. Um, and you need people to, be able to win that sort of war. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you say about new challenges, Hamish, because at the same time, you, you've mentioned in the course of this webinar, two weapons, anthrax, which you studied as a possible one, uh, and chlorine, which you saw the horrible effects of. Both of those were used extensively in the First World War. And we rather thought we'd buried them um, in the aftermath of World War I. Neither was used in World War II, a minor use of chemical weapons on the battlefield, but the, the horrors of chemical um, substances in World War II were in the concentration camps, not on the field of battle. Uh, and it troubles me greatly that 100 plus years after World War I ended, we still don't really have the apparatus for dealing either medically, physically, or legally with weapons that we've known about for a century. I think that, that is one of the, the, the great dichotomies that, you know, almost for a hundred years, chemical weapons were, were not used. Um, it wasn't until the Iran-Iraq war uh, that they were used. And, and then Halabja, 1988, when, Saddam Hussein in his Alpha Anfal campaign um, dropped a huge amount of chemical weapons on, on the town of Labja, kill, killing over 17,000 people, uh, a, a place I've been to many times and really started my affiliation with the Kurds. But I think it goes back to the point I was making earlier. The, the, these are brilliantly effective weapons. The fact that they were not used in the, in the Second World War, I think really kept them off the streets, as it were, for, for that length of time. Um, the, the theory goes that Adolf Hitler was gassed in the First World War and, and that had a profound effect on him. And he also believed that, that the Allies were possessed the, the sort of nuclear bomb way before him. But um, the fact they weren't used for 100 years, the fact that they have been used extensively in Syria and, you know, in my opinion, kept Assad in power, has really put them back you know, on, on, on everybody's lists. And, you know, when we look at something like Novichok, which was designed by the Russians to overmatch NATO's capabilities to defend against it, I think we, we, we really got to make sure that we do get processes in place and, and, and firm up the Chemical Weapons Convention to make sure that these weapons aren't used. Because there will all be, always be weapons in war. But the really abhorrent thing about chemical and biological weapons is they tend to kill and injure innocent civilians who have no protection against them. At least soldiers have you know, gas masks and, uh, and other things, and they're completely indiscriminate. And if anything you know, positive comes out of Salisbury will be a redefining of the Chemical Weapons Convention. And the point that you were making and Steve were making earlier on is, you know, how do we get the UN and the UN Security Council to become an organization that actually agrees um, uh, new legal frameworks without the Chinese or the Russians vetoing anything that you know, they don't particularly like or, or acts against their national interests. I mean, I, I pick up on Chris's point earlier that uh, we need to enforce what we've got as well, but um, I, I think there is a, a, a gloss to what you've just said, Hamish, um, and I'll sort of pass it back to Chris if I may, but, and that is that from a domestic political point of view, there is also a challenge. It's a particular challenge for democracies, but uh, of course in autocracies, there's rather less sort of caring approach to the people necessarily. But in a democracy, it's quite difficult to get consent through the votes in parliament for large amounts of money in order to have the government set up its own insurance policy against an unknown, maybe may never happen event because most taxpayers are thinking, why should the money, hoard, why should the government hoard my money? And so it's very difficult, whether you're designing the armed forces for the future rather than the past, or whether you're designing, whether we should have lots and lots of PPE in stock all over the country so we could be ready to respond. That's very difficult to secure through a political process of allocating the necessary resources to do something contingent like that. And that's maybe, I'm postulating, maybe one of the lessons that is drawn from the COVID 
experience in the light of all the expertise and experience that you've described of where it's used in hostile arrangements, but being international, so easily translated back to our domestic scene, is that maybe we will decide that it's worth having a, a much better contingent preparation to meet these threats so we don't have to then run around chasing once the evidence is before our eyes. That's a sort of gloss to what you said. Uh, it's a hope, I think, more than maybe an expectation, but I think it's worth aiming for. Stephen, thank you. I, I think this is a good point at which to switch to the, the questions that we've had, and we've got a series of very interesting ones. Uh, let me put the first question, which is from anonymous questioner. Uh, another form of biological warfare is depriving populations under occupation of COVID-19 vaccines, while the occupier vaccinates themselves as well as the settlers living in the occupied land. It just happens that the biological weapon is vaccine deprivation. Is this not biological warfare as well? What do you think of it from a legal and ethical point of view? Um, Stephen, would you like to have a first crack at that? I think this is a very, very well, clearly topical, but also extremely difficult question. Um, I think it's very easy uh, for me to give you the answer that we should have vaccine equity and that all populations should be treated uh, with the same level of access and tiered need uh, because you cannot beat the phrase that until everybody's safe, no one's safe from these highly transmissible international border crossing pathogens. But there will just be an intervention to some degree, both of politics and the marketplace. And to some degree uh, where people have done uh, the huge expenditure on research and therefore, if you like, um, to, uh, to be rather sort of blunt about, uh, in a sort of legal way, you know, nine tenths, uh, um, is, is the, of a possession is, is effectively becomes yours. You will treat your own people first, particularly it has to be said when you're trying to make sure you have the support and the democracy of your own people and you're wanting a return on that big, uh, effort. Um, so I, I, I think there is a big question to be uh, answered as to how we stop this being used uh, or abused in a way which puts people under a subjugation. I don't have a ready answer for it, but I think we're in that debate now. Um, uh, I, I can guess the um, part of the geographic uh, world that you're referring to. Um, there is, uh, we, there, there will be a supply and demand issue, but I think the main thing is equity. Um, but maybe, Chris, you have a view on whether the law bites on that. I, and, and Hamish will certainly have a view on whether technically uh, I'm on the right ground. Well, the, the law bites on it in this sense, that the an occupying power has a clear legal responsibility for the health of the population of the occupied territory. It's quite different from the sort of broader moral question and practical question of how can we be safe unless we vaccinate others? Should we not vaccinate others? But um, Hamish, I'd be interested in your perspective on this question. Well, I have you know, very real experience of, of this again in Syria and in Idlib province, which is the one area not under regime control now, area about the size of Wales, 4 million people trapped in it, um, dealing with COVID as well. The last time um, I had discussions with people there and uh, other pe people in the audience might know a lot better than me, um, you know, for those 4 million people, there were only a handful of ventilators to protect them. Um, you know, very few medicines to, to help these people. They certainly weren't getting anything from the Syrian regime. And of course, most of the UN humanitarian aid is now funneled through the Syrian regime. Um, and but actually, you know, bizarrely, because so many people are malnourished in Idlib province and are generally young, you know, the actual death rates and else are, are, are fairly, fairly small, certainly compared to this country. But, you know, what hope that they will get vaccinated in the near future? I, you know, I very much hope that the British government and we do seem to be doing well on the vaccine front and you know, I had my vaccine yesterday, which, you know, uh, is, is the silver bullet out of this nightmare, you know, for us here in the UK and for everybody around the world. And I agree with Stephen, you know, everybody's got to be done before we're safe. Um, 
and, and it's it's a huge challenge. But I, I agree with the questioner. This is a form, you know, of biological warfare. Uh, and as you say, Christopher, you know, withholding medical aid from an occupying power, you know, that 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 is clearly wrong. Um, and hopefully, as the vaccine becomes more available, then you know everybody is going to get a go at it. Um, but it's yeah, it's there's not a simple solution, as Stephen has said. Thank you very much. Now, there's an, an interesting question that follows on from that from Martin Britnell, former UK sur military surgeon general and now professor at King's College London. Um, he thanks the two of you for a stimulating discussion, but adds, I would value your thoughts on the potential role for the UK as an exemplar for the ethical use of military force, or whether our own reputation has been tarnished by our associations with allies or coalitions over the past 20 years. I don't know, Stephen, whether you'd like to have first crack at that. Well, I'd better declare an interest, I think, because one of my three children is now a, um, a rising senior officer uh, in, the, in the army, in the rifles. Uh, so one of these boots on the ground. Um, and uh, he's the first to say how much he feels that his job is equally, clearly he is training and, uh, and being a soldier, just like Hamish, Hamish has passed. But at the same time, he is also very proud of the fact that he is part of a, a British army, which is sending uh, on, on the basis of country to country agreements, a contingents of our British army officers to go and train units of the Nigerian army, for instance, on the way human rights law bites into their role and what they have to be thinking about, even when they are under orders and in combat, um, uh, which is to do with justifications and the rules of war or to train uh, anti-poaching uh, people in Gabon, for instance. I mean, these are all part of the wider skill base being used for uh, non-combat affairs, but I think uh, part of what, um, even acknowledging that there will always be very differing views about the use of the British uh, armed forces and the uh, tremendous professionalism that they've demonstrated over many, many decades, uh, nonetheless, I think the fact that they're held in such high reputation around the world, and I certainly echo Hamish's concerns that if we reduce them too far, uh, that will be at risk. But I, I do think that that is uh, not undeserved because of the way that the doctrine and the military training. And it was very interesting when I was in Parliament, I had the privilege of being able to go and at least witness Santa's training uh, of our officers. And I came out thinking perhaps with my background in business, that the core business of Santos was not so much teaching people war fighting. It was actually teaching leadership and how do you maintain constant excellence in training? And those were the cores of the way the, the army certainly works. I don't have as much insight into the other uh, two of the tri-services. So I would, I would answer quite positively that I think we've got a reasonably well-earned reputation and um, and I think the soldiers have, and uh, the other members of the armed forces have, have shown professionalism in acting out the orders which ultimately come from the politicians. And I think it's the politicians for whom you should hold account, but the reputation of the armed forces, I think, is, is sound. Yes, thank you. Well, if we're declaring interests, I, I should declare a similar interest because although I'm a career civilian, my daughter is an army officer, one of my two daughters. <laughs> they are. She served in Afghanistan. So uh, yes, it's very, very difficult now. Um, Two questions on Syria, which I'm going to put together, if the questions will forgive me, and then um, push to Hamish first of all. Um, what hope is there for IHL when states clearly contravene it in Syria and Yemen, etc.? Do the panel think the Biden administration will put the teeth back into IHL and the UN Security Council? And there's also a question here, how does the panel think the Syria conflict will be brought to an end? There seems little hope from where I sit in Syria. Yeah, that, that, let me take that first. It, it's, um, as I said at the very beginning, the Syrian people are very, very close to my heart. And uh, I do feel that, that we have been let down. Um, you know, what, what is the end of the Syrian conflict? Uh, one of the other unfortunate um, uh, second order issues with COVID is that places like Syria, or Syria in particular, have been very much put on the back burner. You know, when was the last Syrian piece on the news? You know, I, I 
done a lot of work with journalists and others through, throughout ta- time and done many pieces on Syria, but I, I haven't done anything for the last year. And it's, it's sort of forgotten. And, and, you know, Syria is at the edge of the Mediterranean. Um, and when we look at our, we were talking about interventions earlier on, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, it is Syria and the Levant, which is, you know, this is where ISIS, the jihadis, the breeding ground, these are the people that have impact in this country from a terrorist perspective. And by not engaging there, um, we're almost, it's like playing football with just a goalie. We've got to get out to make sure that we keep terror away. But when it comes to Syria, you know, there, there has been, I know, I know uh, um, when, when Stephen was in DFID and an FCDO now, well, I'm, I'm sure, you know, somebody on the, this call will tell us that we've, you know, given over three billion pounds worth of aid uh, to Syria. Um, but actually, you know, that is not changing the political landscape in Syria. What, what is a good solution for Syria? I, I'm, I'm one who hope that, you know, we will, you know, there will be an end to the fighting there. And, and there will be, you know, a chance for the international community to, to rebuild that country. But I fear with the Russians now so entrenched uh, and their strategic requirements for a air base and a sea base in the Mediterranean achieved, you know, they are, you know, very unlikely to give much ground there. So I slightly fear for that. And, and the person who, who is putting this question from Syria, um, you know, I, I very much do feel for them. And it goes back to the point, you know, that I think you know, this is an intervention we should have done some time ago, but, but looking back, it's not gonna help at all. I think we must move forward. And I am, uh, I'm very positive about the new president. Uh, and I think President Biden has already um, indicated that he is prepared to make up some of the ground perhaps he'd lost in the last four years. Um, you know, rejoining the World Health Organization uh, and the important, hugely important funding that Americans uh, put into that will give teeth to that organization that has a key role to play here and has had a, you know, a lot of criticism, I think a lot of it perhaps you know, unfair uh, and that will be a positive thing. Um, I think if Biden will engage more in the Middle East rather than uh, using you know, strategic missiles that stand off so far to take out individual targets, then there is a chance that we will have some sort of uh, more positive resolution. But until the UN, the World Health Organization, and I expect the key players in the UN Security Council focus again on Syria, I fear we're going to get more of the same um, for, the, for the next few years. Um, so I, I'm positive that, that the new president, and we need to support him, uh, and I hope that um, the British government will do that. Thank you very much. Stephen, I, I want to come to you with a question here. Um, how will significant reductions in the overseas development budget affect Britain's role in the world? Have we had the rug pulled from under us? Well, I hope not. But of course, you know, I, I uh, am passionate about our commitment to having the necessary predictable funding for our role as global citizens, and particularly with our enormous technical experience and expertise of how do you do humanitarian response and uh, development. And it was part of the World Humanitarian Summit back in May 16, that we tried also to make sure that we understood how to get the nexus between those two responses and our participation in the multilateral instruments that enable all that to happen. And obviously it was my job to seek to coordinate a lot of that response. But I, I, uh, and, and I think the 0.7% law, which I'm obviously proud to be a co-architect, is very important. And the recent announcement that because of the current fiscal challenge, which of course COVID has brought on, on everybody, uh, means that that's uh, going down to 0.5% and there's currently a discussion in government I can see that there's going to be a big challenge on funding and it will fall, sadly, on the discretionary funding, which is mainly programmes in overseas countries rather than our subs to the UN and so forth. And linked to the previous question, you know, I too welcome uh, Biden's uh, election and approach to the rejoining of the multilateral rules-based system. 
uh, not least because of two excellent appointments in Linda Thomas Greenfield as the UN's uh, permanent represent the US's permanent representative, who I work with closely in Africa, and Samantha Power, who used to have that job and is now head of USA, because I think she will bring a very clear-eyed human rights perspective to to that as well. And I think that's a great team that helps us realise that yes, we will need to get back to that level of UK commitment and I hope the therefore the reduction to 0.5 percent notwithstanding DFID folding into FCDO uh, will find itself back there and we might even make up the difference in the years to come as our fiscal position uh, improves post uh, COVID and the recovery which I'm confident we will we will manage and I think therefore the temporary uh, uh, effect it could have upon reputation of the UK with states in these areas uh, could be important uh, and may be diminishing. And that is a serious issue, both in terms of our ability to, to do aid, humanitarian response, but also trade, to be frank, as well. And I think that the, um, the way to mitigate that is to show real determination to work through the multilateral system um, and to show that we are uh, strong players in the, in the way that we work with others to give maximum effect to support people where necessary. I mean, I think it is important that it's linked to um, a confidence that whilst I, I do worry that, um, for instance, in, as you were just discussing, the, the end of the Syrian conflict, I mean, I hope, of course, it's not going to be on the back of Idlib being wiped out either by COVID or by an attack. I don't rule that out, I'm sad to say, but um, uh, let's hope it's not or that something else intervenes to make it difficult. But already we're under challenge because it, and again, it goes back to some of these legal mechanisms, um, Secretary, which you're so familiar with. And that is that the, 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 the agreements between us around the world, and why the UN's charter, which is an amazing document, has survived 75 years, more or less without amendment. But despite starting with we the peoples, it's actually a complete discussion about the states of the world and who's prepared to stand up as a state rather than people. And so the whole thing is dependent upon the way states behave and depend, depends upon borders. And so the whole of this is linked to whether we can try and find a way of, of being accountable that is much more um, individual and collective rather than necessary uh, dependent upon the states. That's why I worry terribly on Syria that the UN process, which you know, has lasted for years, and as I said earlier, Stefan de Mistura did his very best to try and bring the parties together, but it's been hijacked by a sort of tailor-made Russian, Iranian, Syrian process called Astana, where the UN's allowed occasionally to turn up. But Astana isn't motivated to end the conflict in Syria, particularly if the end of the conflict in Syria might mean some form of accountability. And that's exactly what they want to avoid. So it's much better to have a process which never ends. So. There's a sort of, I'm afraid I'm, I'm sort of glass half full, half empty on that one. Right now, we've got, we're running short of time. I've got two questions I'm going to pick here. And my apologies to those who've asked the ones I haven't been able to pick. The first of which I'd be grateful for a quick view from both of you, from a donor rep. Is the civil military development nexus really the way forward when we have little overhead protection from the UN Security Council? Governments have run rings around us. Hamish, what do you think? Well, I, I think the, the civil military nexus is absolutely key. And I, I, I like, like Stephen, I hope that the reduction in the budget is, is, a, is a COVID issue rather than goes further forward, because I think it's fundamental. And, and to step back a little, I, I'm a fan of, of DFID and the FCO being joined. And I, I actually would like to see a much closer relationship with the Ministry of Defence. Certainly my experiences in Afghanistan, where you know, the humanitarian piece was, should have been very much integrated. You know, I got involved in alternative cropping in Afghanistan. I was actually an intelligence role because I had a degree in agriculture and um, actually some fantastic things could have been done, but there was just, you know, a missing piece there. So I, I, I think the military have a huge role to play. And I think on the humanitarian side, oh, I feel, you know, I really feel for the humanitarians who work in war zones, because I think, you know, they they have a really difficult part to play here. And unless they unless they are fully integrated and, and wrapped up with the other agencies there, it's difficult. But it, the the 
key point here is the point that, that I think you make, Christopher, that without the umbrella, particularly the UN Security Council, to make sure that these things can happen with general consensus in the UN, you know, it's going to be tremendously difficult. And that, that's why you know, I'm pleased that, that Biden is now um, the president who hopefully will have the ability to get things moving in the UN and hopefully get the Russians and the Chinese on board so that we can you know, be more active and achieve more in this area. Stephen, would you like to add something? Just, just very briefly, I think um, there's no question the civil military nexus is proven beyond degree to be one of the best instruments for humanitarian survive and thrive strategies wherever you need them from the natural disaster world. The trouble is that's such a small proportion of the need of the world for humanitarian response. So the big question for Civ Mill is how do you get that to be acceptable and legitimate into conflict zones? And it ties back to something that Sir Christopher said earlier, and that is there's such a reluctance in the international diplomatic and other instruments to, um, we all feel very constrained when we're in those jobs, uh, to in interfere in the internal affairs of another state. And that makes it almost impossible when you're sitting around the U UN Security Council table, as I know to my cost, you know, you try to advocate something and you're told, no, that's the internal affairs. A sad's perfectly entitled to if 6.5 million people of his own people want to flee their homes internally, you've got no role. And there's no way that you should be supplying any kind of uh, food or support or blankets for them. And so there is this problem about being able to get in. And this is where the military are so often clearly not invited in to a conflict area. And, and I think that's where the debate now lies as to how could we legitimise some form of probably non-uniformed use of our um, military personnel primarily, but also assets to help deliver um, protected and, uh, and objective uh, uh, humanitarian aid, conforming with IHL. So you meet the need first. Uh, take Yemen at the moment. There's a lot of money available. But it is unfortunately coming from a source which is a party to the to the war and only wants to supply the side that it's supporting, whereas a lot of the need is actually on the other side and, and it basically needs a ceasefire. So you stop talking about sides and you talk about need. So um, I am concerned about that. As for um, the bigger question, which is ultimately whether the UN should have a role, given I think it's pretty forlorn to hope that somehow the P5 are going to be motivated to give up their veto. Uh, for the UN Security Council to have any form of um, way of doing better than it does at the moment, where things are pretty well stuck, is whether it moves from a peacekeeping uh, mandate to having some form of peacemaking mandate. This is a big question. I'm not going to pretend to go into the depth of it now, but I do think it's a, a point worth making. because That could just be one of the keys to help unlock that blockage. Yes, thank you. I, one thing just on this question of the civil military development nexus. When I started working purely as an academic in this field in the 1980s, there was, I thought, a real suspicion on the part of the people I met from the various humanitarian NGOs of anything to do with anyone's military. Yeah, I don't hear. I don't hear that nowadays, not with people who work in relief aid and so on, you hear it more often from people who've never set foot in anything outside the United Kingdom. Yes. Uh, ironically, um, much more enthusiasm for working with the army in delivering um, relief supplies in Africa than there is from some people in the NHS in having the military involved in vaccination programmes against COVID. But it's uh, spot, spot, spot on, except that's with our army. I mean, yeah. we still had the problem of in northeastern Nigeria getting the NGOs to be anywhere near, the only way you could get a convoy to the girls who'd been taken hostage in the forest was to go with the Nigerian army as they pushed the bow wave forward. And the real problem was, of course, you didn't want, to, none of the NGOs wanted to be with the Nigerian army. So I'm not gonna make any comment about the Nigerian army. The point is it was with an army they felt uh, they could uh, trust on the grounds that, you know, we've referred to on the British army earlier. So I think it's, it's um, it's, it's a long way better, but not over, Chris. Okay, one last question, which I'm going to put just for a quick two minutes from each of you, and then we must stop. And that is perhaps the most fundamental question of the lot. Does the UK have a foreign policy in the Middle East? Hamish. 
Well, that, that, that is a great question. I should really palm that off to Stephen, I expect. Certainly in my experience, um, working with the Kurds uh, and in Syria over the last five years, it's very been very difficult to understand exactly what that policy is um, and what is bounded by it. I found it tremendously difficult to get anything more than verbal support uh, for activities. And I go back to one of the points I made at the very, very beginning. You know, Syria is such a fundamental country and its security to the security of the United Kingdom that we must have some foreign policy that enables that. And at the moment, I, I'm just not sure. I think the question is, is fundamental and great. And it would be, it would be uh, wonderful to have the Foreign Secretary, uh, Mr. Rab here, to explain exactly what the British foreign policy is in the Middle East. I hope moving forward, and again, once the fog of COVID has lifted, that we can refocus again on the Middle East, because from a terror and military perspective, you know, that is the hotbed. And that is the area that is going to be most threatening uh, to the UK, particularly from a terror perspective. Okay, much, thank you. Dominic Rabb, of course, who many of us remember as a legal advisor in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office before he went. Indeed so. Indeed so. Um, very, very briefly, but um, I think it's very difficult to say that there's a foreign policy for the Middle East. I think we do have items of foreign policy that bear on the Middle East, particularly the continued adherence to a two-state solution for the uh, uh, Israel-Palestine uh, issue, uh, the support through the UN for aid to the occupied Palestinian territories, which is obviously a phrase which, when used even at the UN, the Israelis will always come in and see you and object to very strongly. Um, and uh, we are, I think, uh, somewhat cagey, to say the least, uh, in having to make choices between where there are developing and very difficult splits within the Middle East. So the sort of Turkey, Egypt, uh, sorry, Turkey, Qatar axis versus the sort of Saudi, Egypt, uh, UAE axis. Um, and these are state axes as against the Sunni Shia uh, issues and the whole issue about Iran. But I think that we've got elements of a Middle Eastern policy I think it's quite difficult to have a holistic one other than to say we would like to see peace everywhere. Of course we would. But to do that, you're going to have to be much more fine grained. And at the moment, putting a series of sort of strong bilateral efforts together is runs the risk of us being uncoordinated, and not quite sympathising with the way that the region itself uh, sees itself, which is uh, a part of the way of making quite disputatious alliances, uh, which is tricky. And of course, at the moment, whilst I'm absolutely with, with Hamish in the horror and the complete uh, disappointment in the international community's ability to be able to tackle an end to Syria, uh, my obsession at the moment is the absolute horror that's going on in Yemen, which I described and uh, termed the world's worst humanitarian disaster back in quite early 2016. And I see as being repeated even now. So yeah, we're not making progress on that one. And some pretty obvious choices that we need to make in order to try and bring that to an end. And in fairness, I think President Biden has started to give us a bit of a pathway. Stephen, thank you very much. I'm afraid at that point, we're going to have to leave it. And I'd like to just wrap everything up. Uh, I see a, a message here saying that uh, there have been lots of WhatsApp messages from uh, message questions. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to everything people have asked. But let me thank very much um, Sir Stephen O'Brien, uh, who brought his political and humanitarian experience to bear on this, and uh, Hamish de Breton Gordon, uh, the author of Chemical Warrior, who brings the experience of years as one of the boots on the ground, um, both first in the military and then afterwards in his post military career. Uh, it's very humbling for me as somebody who sits here largely in a university rather than uh, having been involved in that direct way. But thank you both very much. And can I also take this opportunity to thank the various organizers of this seminar today, Adam Coots, uh, but also Bradley Robinson, but also the institutions, uh, the University of Cambridge, King's College London, Magdalen College Cambridge, which is perhaps a little overrepresented as uh, uh, you're an Emmanuel man yourself, I think, Stephen. I, I am indeed. That's <laughs> right. I've, got, I've got the tie on to prove it. Yes, there's no need to feel embarrassed about that. And, uh, <laughs> the, um, 
but also RH4C and uh, the Global Challenge Research Fund. Uh, thank you very much for arranging this and to our participants, thank you for taking part. It's been, I think we'd all agree, a most stimulating discussion. So may I wish you